When Jesus says yes, nobody can say no. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very good. Now let's make it personal. Instead of whosoever, put your name there. Instead of for God so loved the world, put your name there. Let's make it personal. Once again, for God so loved Gene that he gave his only begotten son, that if Gene believes in him, he would not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the way we should read scripture. We should see ourselves in scripture. It's not just a word from history. It's a word that's right now. It's a today word. God so loved us. God so loved you that he gave his only son for you. If it had only been you, he still would have given his son just for you. Just for you. I'm reminded of a bridge operator who took his son to work. His son loved trains. And the operator had one task was really to raise the bridge so that the boats can go through the river and lower the bridge so that the trains could pass safely by. And he notices that it was a slow day and his son had kind of drifted away from the station. But one of the trains were beginning to arrive early. He looks out to ensure that the tracks were clear. But he notices that his son had made his way to the platform. As he's screaming to his son, his son couldn't hear him for all the noise that was around him. And he's screaming at the top of his lungs for him to get off of the track. His son turns and sees his dad and waves and he misses his footing. And he falls off the platform and he's caught between the gears of the bridge. And he's suspended there. His father has a decision to make. He sees the train approaching and he knows that if he lowers the bridge, he will crush and kill his son. But if he keeps the bridge raised and spares his son, then the train would derail. They would crash into the river, killing everybody on the train. A very difficult decision he has to make. And he's screaming in anguish because he has to do something. And he turns his face away from his son and he pulls the lever. And the train and the track lowers, killing his son. And as the passengers went by, they were unfazed as to the sacrifice that was just made for them. They went on about their business as usual, day by day, not aware of the cost that their lives were spared. For the sake of one, their lives were spared. Can you see the parallel? That day by day, people pass by and they're unfazed by the sacrifice that was made for them. That God so loved, not just the believers, God so loved the world that while we were unsaved, while we were still sinners, he was dying on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. It wasn't that we were so good. It wasn't about we deserved anything. It's because he sent his only son. Because he loved us so much. Can you imagine someone loving you that much that they would give their life for you? God so loved. The degree of God's love was determined by the degree of God's giving. When you love so much, you give so much. Make a note. The degree of your love is determined by the degree of your giving. The degree of your love is determined by the degree of your giving. When you truly love, truly love, you can't give enough. No matter what your love is for, when you truly love, you cannot give enough. God loved you and I so much that he gave his only. First of all, there's a sacrifice to give your only of anything. We're selfish by nature. If we've got a couple, we may give one up. But if we've got only one, you, you can't have my one and only. You've got to get your own. God so loved us. He had his beloved son. 
Now in scripture, sons pass on the lineage of the father. So if you had a son, that means that when you were not here, your sons would pass on your name and your lineage. So when you had one son, you treasured that one son. You think about when Abraham was asked by God to show his love and demonstrate his faithfulness to God. He says, take Isaac, your only son, and take him and sacrifice him at a place that I will show you. Can you imagine the difficulty that was for Abraham? God, I prayed for a son. You promised me a son. And now I've got a son in my old age. And you're telling me to sacrifice my son. But the scripture said that Abraham believed God. And when you really believe God, there's no limit to what you'll do for God. Dr. King said that if a man has not found a cause worth dying for, he's not fit to live. When you really believe in something, when you really believe that you're willing to die for that cause. As you know, Abraham took his son up and as he was about to slay his son, the angel said, do not harm the boy. Because now I know. Abraham was being tested by the sacrifice that he would make. God tests us sometimes by what sacrifice we're willing to make for him. Because with your sacrifice, God says, now I know. That you give up your one and only. Now I know, Abraham. Do not harm the boy. Now I know. Does God know? When it comes to your life, does God really know the extent of your love for him? Is it measured by what you're doing? Is there a sacrifice that's worthy of the marriage that God gave so much? What are you giving back to God? That God will say, now I know. We talk about reading the scripture in a whole year. A whole year. Not in a week, a month. A whole year. We're going to read the Bible in one year. And we start off really strong in the beginning of the year. And then about Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which kind of phases out. And God says, now I know. Now I know. Or we come to church. The service starts, the worship starts at 10 a.m. And we come around 10, 15, 10, 20, 10, 30. God says, now I know. Now I know. We have our midweek groups our studies, our outreach. Plenty of opportunities for us to be a witness for Jesus. And when the few, the faithful few are out there doing it, the rest of us are at home because there's so many things that we have to do. God says, now I know. He knows. But here's the, here's the beauty of it. God knows you, but God says, I still love you. Amen. He still believes in you. Even though we may not believe in ourselves sometimes, God says, I still love you, I still believe you, and I care for you. God gave his only son that whosoever, that whoever, whoever, that means you don't even have to have a name, you don't even have to qualify, you are just a whoever. And if you believe in him, he says you will not perish, but you'll have what? That's a promise, isn't it? Everlasting life. I see some of you taking notes. I hope you have your notes journals. If anybody does not have a notes journal, we, want, we encourage everybody to take notes. I heard that in 72 hours, and, and by Wednesday, you forgot 90% of what I've said. By Wednesday. <laughs> You've forgotten everything. If you were tested on Wednesday, you would fail. By Friday, you forgot who I was. <laughs> I see myself as God sees me. Say it with me. I see myself as God sees me. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. New creation. Say new creation. new creation. What happens to the old things? Passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Pastor loved that verse. I like that. That's like one of my favorites. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? New. When you grasp this new creation reality, it changes your life. Everything else has passed away, and all things are new. You're defined by what God sees in you. 
There was a friend of mine, I'm a, I'm a member of a Toastmasters group, and a friend of mine wanted to become president of the group because he had some wonderful ideas for the club. And once he became president, he started to try to implement a lot of things without really getting the buy-in from the other officers. So he kept wanting to make changes. And they started to challenge some of the changes that he was making. So he got upset because he was challenged and he quit. He quit, he, he stepped down from his office as president, and then he quit the group. And I called him just to see how he was doing. And he was telling me that he wasn't feeling well, he had some things going on at home, and he had some health issues he had to look after, so he needed to just take some time off. Now deep down I knew that he was hurt because of some things that happened. So I gave him another week. Just call him and check on you again. He tells me, well, I'm doing a little bit better. And I said, you know, I sense that you are hurt by some things that went on. And I want to share with you that people really care about you. We really respect you a lot. And listen to me. Listen to me. You need to come back and make things right. I say it's easy for you to just want to take that feeling that you had and take it, make it personal and just want to end it there. But there's a better way of dealing with things. And everybody needs to listen to someone. And I'm just telling you, I, I counsel you, encourage you, just listen. Come back and let's make things right. And the same counsel that I give to him, I give to you. So often emotional decisions, something happens that you don't like, cause you to take a turn. It may not be the best option that you chose. Listen to people that God placed in your life. If you know how unbelievers do things, and if you're a child of God, don't do the very thing that you know that God despises. There's a high road. The Bible says set your mind on things above, not things that are beneath. And he understood where I was coming from. I'm not certain if he'll show up, but I would like to believe that he has reconsidered because I have took the time to go and just speak with him. To let him know that I care and that other people care also. How does God see you? God does not see you by your failures or what didn't go well. You're not defined by your failures. God knows everything about you, everything that you did right, wrong, and indifferent, and God still loves you. Isn't that good news? He knows you're good, bad, and ugly. And we have a lot of ugly sometimes, honey. God still loves us. There was a show a long time ago called This Is Your Life. You can imagine you come to church and all of a sudden your life starts playing out on the screen. That wouldn't be good, would it? But God knows. And God says, I still believe and I love you. He loves us that much. He will never give up on us. He will never forsake us. He says he will never leave us. He loves us that much. So we should see ourselves not by our finances even. Sometimes we judge people about how much money they make or what position they have. You're not judged by that or what kind of car you drive or where you live. You're judged by how God sees you. And God says you're blessed and highly favored. You are God's own. He says you're more than a conqueror. God loves you and I so much that he died on the cross for us. God loves me perfectly and unconditionally. Perfectly and unconditionally. And I'm going to go to 1 John 3.16. Perfectly and unconditionally. That means there's nothing that you could do that would cause God to not love you. We were in, we were in a, a vacation Bible school and a Sunday school in class. We had this song that said, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. How do you know Jesus loves you? Because the Bible tells me so. People will 
despise you and reject you. They will walk away from you. But Jesus says, I love you and I will always be there. Amen. And in 1 John. Now John 3.16 is a scripture that we read, but I also want you to keep in mind 1 John 3.16. Because John 3.16 talks about God's love for us. 1 John 3.16 talks about Jesus' love. By this we know love. Because he laid down his life for what? For us. Somebody say for me. Amen. For me. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. His love was not based upon our perfection or anything that we did. There's nothing that you and I could do or have ever done to merit God's love. It's unconditional. No matter what you can say or do, God says, I still love you. And why I'm talking about love is that I want you to know that you're not defined by anything more than God's love. Not past, not pain, not situations, not disappointments. You are defined by God's love. And God loves you so much that he paid the ultimate price, which was the life of his son, Jesus. Amen. That's the price paid for you. We buy clothing, we buy houses and cars, and we boast about how much we spent on this. I saw one guy that had a Rolex watch. <clears throat> he said, this cost $5,000. And I looked at it, and it didn't say Rolex, it said Relax. <laughs> One of those knockoffs. He kept moving and said, it's cost me. Said, that's, not, that's not even real. <laughs> but we want to fake it until we make it. <laughs> Believing that we're something that we're not. Yeah. And we take value, we place it on what we drive. I knew friends that used to buy these cars, they buy these expensive cars so people, it would look like they, they, they deserved and were something that they were not. We will put so much into trying to convince people that we have value. Yes. But your real value is not on what you wear Amen. or what you have. Your value is on the price that was paid. <laughs> and the price that was paid for you was Jesus Christ's life Amen. on Calvary. Yes. He died for you. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that your body and my body are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. We were bought at a great price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Everything we have belongs to him. Yes. Everything we have, we give God glory for. Yes. There's nothing that I can say, I got this because I worked so hard, I deserve. It's only because God allowed things to happen in your life. Amen. It's God's mercy and God's grace that allows good things to come to you. Any good that happens to you is not because you're deserving. Yeah. It's not because you're so good or that you're worthy. It's because God loves you and I in spite of us. Yeah. It's nothing about you and I that we can boast about. I can't boast about my degree or what I've got or what I've done. All I can boast about is that everything I do and everything I am, I owe to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Yeah. It's all about Him. And he loved me. God could have chosen anybody to receive and to have and be you. But God trusted you to be you. Whether you like yourself or not, God loves you. Yes. Amen. And God says, I, I could have chosen anyone, but I chose you. Yes. And God's telling us he's not done with us yet. Amen. He's not done. Your best and my best are yet to come. Amen. Amen. Your best is still yet to come. You're getting better every day, yes. better looking, yes. stronger, yes. smarter. Yes. Your best days are still ahead. Somebody say amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Number three, nothing can separate me from God's love. Yes. Nothing can separate me from God's love. Uh -huh. God is pleased with you. I want you to know that. Yes. He's pleased with you and I. When you were born, your parents were pleased with you. I hope. <laughs> they didn't look at you and say, oh, we got to keep them. <laughs> your parents were pleased with you. They took pictures and they sent pictures of you to neighbors and friends and family. And you still say, oh, what a nice looking baby. Is that a baby? <laughs> but we know what it's like. There's only one good-looking baby in the world, and every parent has it. That's where it is. God is so pleased with you. 
when Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened. And like a dove, the Spirit descended and rested upon him. And then God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And God sees you the same way. God loves you. And God said, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And we think that we have to do something to please God. God loves us for who we are. Because Jesus did it all. He did it all. So there's nothing that we can do to show God or to perform so that God says, you know, I'm really pleased with how you did that. He loves you. And no matter what you do, he's still pleased with you. Amen. There was one son that was so disruptive. Their parents didn't know what they were going to do with him. And finally they said, tell you what, no matter what he does, tell him you love him and tell him he did a great job. So he never does anything good. So just whatever he does. So they started complimenting him. And he was looking around to see who they were talking to. <laughs> He's such a good boy. We love you. So he says, I got to do something to get to work to merit all of this thanks. So he started changing a few things and doing some things. And they started just pouring unconditional love onto him and letting him know how much they cared, how much they appreciate him. And his life began to change because he recognized that they saw what he didn't see in himself. And what we have to know is that God sees in us what we don't see in ourselves. And sometimes we condemn ourselves because we're not as good as what we think we should be. We're not as good as what somebody else is. And we devalue ourselves based upon someone else's value. I don't have what they have. I don't get the attention that they get. They do much better than me. I'm not good at anything. God says, you being you. And I will use you for my glory. If you would accept God's love and know that whatever you do, start doing it for the glory of God. Don't do it for any recognition. Don't do it so that anybody can pat you on the back and say, oh, you did a good job. Because if they stop saying that, you'll stop doing. But if you do all that you do as unto the Lord, you'll find that God's love and mercy and glory just starts to fill you. And your life changes from the inside out. If nobody else is pleased with you, I want you to know that God is pleased with you. God loves you. He has you in the palm of his hands. You are God's favorite. Did you know I was his favorite? Who says God can have just one favorite, right? He's God. And if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on God's refrigerator. <laughs> For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. Know what people say about you. No matter what you've lost, all your setbacks and disappointments, all of your hardships, all the mean people around you or no other created thing shall be able to separate us from what? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate you and I from God's love. Every day, know that God's mercies are renewed and God has an unfailing love for you. And even on your worst day, God says, I still love you. And when you feel that nobody cares, God says, I care, I love you, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yes. Yes. You are created in the image and likeness of God. When people see you, they are beginning to see and understand God, the presence of God. Allowing God's love to flow through you is what the world needs. Amen. But first we have to accept that love and know that we are complete and whole in Him. Amen. You see those movies where they have these love scenes and they'll say, you complete me. <laughs> he completes us amen? amen when you have him you have everything yeah. you don't have to go out and find someone else to give you value your value comes from God Almighty you're complete and whole in him
And it don't matter whether people approve or disapprove of you, whether they like or don't like you, or don't like how short you are, or they don't like the, how much hair you got, or you got good hair, bad hair, your breath stinks or whatever. It don't matter. God loves all about you. Amen. Your worst God still loves. You may not be as eloquent as others, may not be able to speak the king's English, may not have the most friends, but what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. And the greatest love that we can have is that love. Learning to love God, learning to love Him with all of our hearts. That's the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your what? Neighbor as you love yourself. First, I love the Lord my God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my strength. Get that one right. Work on that one. When you got that love right, now you've got something to offer the world. Amen. If you're missing that first love relationship, then every other relationship has to be built on that one. If that one is not right, then everything else is subject to failure depending on that relationship. Let's get that one right. When you have that love relationship right, it doesn't matter how people treat you. I promise you, you'll have so much love for them that even your enemies will start loving you. Amen. Even the people that despise you will start loving you because you're just not going to just accept anything else but God's love. You ever love somebody past their hate? If you just keep loving them, and just stay in their face. They don't like you, but you just keep saying, you know, I love you. I'm so glad to see you today. Have a wonderful day. They just, soon they'll just either explode. <laughs> they'll just combust in front of you. Why do you love me? I know, I just love you. Nobody loves me. I love you. And that's sometimes what they need to see. Are you going to love them past them? Are you going to look beyond their fault and see their need? You say, some people, Pastor, are difficult to love, you know. God says, yes, you were one of them. <laughs> but he looked beyond that. And he loved us beyond us. And the same way that God loved us is the same way that we look at someone else and recognize what they need is more love. Love. Some people's dipstick of love is so low. If you check the dipstick, it have zero love. What the world now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. One more time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not just for some, but for everyone. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not just for some, but for everyone. Thank you, Father, that your love is never failing. That we could look out and see the world that's struggling and suffering and say what they need is love. And thank you for showing us unconditional and unfailing love. That we now know what it's like to give it. It's not because of what they've done. It's not because of who they are. Because of who you are, Jesus. And because of what you've done. Thank you for your unfailing love.